James Bond here for Dr. Pennsylvania. Today we have past periodical number 33. This one comes from the Reading Eagle, October 30th, 1900. This article took up almost the entire front page, which is why it caught our eye. It is called, Killed His Wife, Then Shot Himself. And it's about a tragedy with the Keffer family. And we thought it was really interesting. Uh, we don't see articles that are this large usually. So this is a longer past periodical, but we think you guys will enjoy it. Here we go. Killed his wife, then shot himself. A double crime near the Ole Turnpike below Reading late Monday afternoon, Charles A. Keffer's fearful deed, his farewell letter to his mother, all the details of a horrible tragedy. Children on their way home from school shortly after 4 p.m. Monday found the body of Mrs. Charles A. Keffer of this city on a lonely road leading from the Ole Turnpike and about a mile north of the Ole Line. She had been shot through the head, two bullets entering near the right eye. Indications pointed to her husband as the murderer. This supposition was fully confirmed when his body was found in the lower section of the city shortly after daylight this morning. He had shot himself through the head. Before taking his life, he had penned a confession, justifying his crime. There were a dozen children in the party which found the body of Mrs. Keffer. Among them were two of Abner Moyers, two, a farmer. They are pupils of the Oriental Schoolhouse located at the corner of the Ole Turnpike in the road along which the tragedy took place. They were passing along the most lonely portion of the highway at a point where it is lined on both sides by a wood, and they were surprised to see lying in the gully along the road a woman in an apparently unconscious condition. They feared to approach closer at first, but finally growing bolder, they made an examination and assured themselves that the woman was dead. Her face and clothing were covered in blood. The children hurried home and told their parents of the discovery. Mr. Moyers summoned several neighbors and, accompanied by the children, proceeded to where the woman lay. Taking one of the arms in his grasp, Mr. Moyer found that the body was turning cold, proving that she had been dead some time. The story brought to Reading immediately after the tragedy was that the children had seen the murderer drive away, that he was a man with a black mustache, and he wore a derby hat, and that he drove a bay horse attached to a buggy, whose running gear was yellow. It is a fact that Kiefer was seen driving towards the city, and some parties started in pursuit, but he eluded them. Mr. Moyer, after hearing the story from his children, at once sent word of the affair to the general store at Ole Line, with the request that the facts be communicated to the authorities in the corner of this city. Inquiry in the neighborhood showed that a man and a woman answering the description of the murder and his victim were seen driving past Gector's Tavern on Lower Alsace shortly after 3 o'clock on Monday afternoon. Later, some passers-by saw them in the woods, apparently gathering chestnuts near where the tragedy took place. The team was tied up along the fence. The murder, however, must have been committed in the carriage. The vehicle, when recovered later, was bespattered with blood. Although premeditated, it must have been done under a sudden impulse. Keffer evidently shot his wife at close range, and then, as she fell out, he must have driven away. Her head pointed to the bottom of the gully where she was found, with her body resting in incline along the side of the road. The first news of the affair to reach the city was received at the district attorney's office. Detective Kirshner secured a team and started off for the scene of the murder. The officer must have passed Keffer on the road. Coroner Rothmel was the next informed of the affair, and at his request, Undertaker Seidel went to the scene and brought the body to the city. He reached Reading shortly after 9 p.m. While the Undertaker arrived at the place, he found that the body had not been moved an inch. When the dead woman was brought to the morgue, an examination was made. Two bullet holes, apparently inflicted by a 32 caliber revolver, were found in the head, one below the right cheekbone and another the back of the right ear. Either of the wounds would have proven fatal. On top of the head 
was a slight bruise, such as could have produced from a fall. The body was placed in Undertaker Seidel's morgue. Some time elapsed before the identity of the woman was established. In this direction, Detective Martz rendered valuable assistance. In the pockets of the dead woman's clothing, he found a purse containing $1.35, a dollar bill, a quarter, two five-cent pieces, and in addition, a tax notice to a Charles A. Keffer from the collector of the Eighth Ward. The dead woman was dressed in a sailor hat, white waist, and black skirt. She was of stout build, almost five foot three inches in height, and weighed about 175 pounds. She had light hair, and her face, though marked by the bullet and bloody marks, showed evidence of one-time prepossessing appearance. A visit was next paid to the Keffer residence at 1038 Washington. It was learned that this house was rented by Charles A. Keffer. With him lived his father and mother, Mr. and Mrs. A. T. C. Keffer, and an aunt, Miss Catherine Weiss. Here it is stated that Keffer shortly after noon left the house. His wife, with the assistance of Mrs. Weiss, had finished the family washing at noon. After dinner, Mrs. Weiss asked Mrs. Keffer whether she was going to do the ironing in the afternoon. Mrs. Keffer replied that she had decided to go to the office of the Reading Iron Company to draw the balance due her husband, who had been employed at the pipe mill, but was then working for a Philadelphia firm which contemplated opening a store on Penn. Mrs. Keffer then dressed herself and left the house. This was the last scene of her alive. About four o'clock, Keffer came home and asked his father if his wife was at home. Upon being told that she had left the house shortly after he had departed, he left also. Keffer's movements indicate that he killed his wife shortly after 3.15 p.m. To make his appearance at his home in the city by 4 o'clock required hard driving. He had evidently abandoned the team on the outskirts of the city and made his way to his home. Mr. Keffer, the father, was questioned by Detective Martz and the Eagle at all. He stated, I cannot understand it at all. I believe it's all a mistake. You say that Charles' wife has been killed. If it is so, it must have been an accident. She left the house at 2 o'clock this afternoon, saying that she was going to draw his wages at the office of the Reading Iron Company. I thought it strange that she didn't come home for supper. She never remained away before after that hour. My son came home at 4 o'clock. No, I didn't notice that he was all excited. He inquired as to his wife, and I told him that she had not yet returned. He remarked that that was strange and then left to go downtown, saying that he had some business to attend to. That was the last I saw of him. It was then after 10 p.m., and Mr. Keffer was asked by Detective March as to what time his son generally returned home. He replied that he was never out very late. Looking at the clock and seeing the time, he thought it strange that Charlie did not return and added that he could not understand it at all. The non-appearance of Keffer convinced the officers that he had killed his wife. The house was shadowed for the remainder of the night, but he remained away. Asked by the Eagle whether his son and wife lived happily together, Mr. Keffer, the father, said that they occasionally had spats. But neighbors stated that recently their relations had been very strained that outbreaks were frequent. When Officer DeHart went on duty for the night, he saw a horse and buggy standing on Buttonwood near 8th. The horse was securely tied to the hitching post. The officer made several trips over his beat and at 9 o'clock found the horse and buggy still there. On making inquiry of persons residing in the locality as to the owner of the driver of the team, the officer learned that the horse and buggy had been in the same place since 4.45 in the afternoon. The officer then took possession of the team and drove it to the police station. The next move was to find the owner. Chief Miller and Sergeant Brown took the matter in hand. A number of the downtown livery stables were visited, but without success. The team was finally driven to Cleaver's livery stable on Cherry and Wood. Here the officer made a close examination of the outfit. Sergeant Brown... Upon picking up the lap robe, a cheap white cotton affair, found it covered with blood spots. Large clots of blood were found next in the buggy box, and upon lifting up the cushion, the seat was found to be thick with clotted blood. This convinced the officers that the murder 
had been committed in the buggy, the team was left in Mr. Cleaver's charge. The owner of the team was finally located about 11.15 p.m. at the Continental Livery Stable, of which George W. Romig is the proprietor. From Mr. Romig, it is learned that at about 1 o'clock in the afternoon, Keffer called at the stable and asked for a horse and buggy. He explained that he wanted to drive to Fleetwood and would be back in the evening. The team, a brown horse and a black and yellow carriage, were given Keffer and he drove away. Keffer did not pay for the hire of the team, but said he would pay the bill when he returned. The theory of Detective Martz and Kirshner, as well as the police, is that Keffer had carefully mapped out his plan for murder. Having secured his wife's consent to take a drive, he procured the team and went to an appointed place where they met. The couple then drove out to Stony Creek Road turned to the right and out past the Ancona schoolhouse and up the road until they reached the hotel familiarity known as Ketcher's Tavern. There they turned to the right through the woods of Lower Alsace and took the road that joins the Oli Pike, a short distance above the Oli Line Hotel. Mrs. Wilson H. Fredericks, 1228 Cotton, the mother of the dead woman, when interviewed by the Eagle regarding the death of her daughter, stated, I expected to get such news at most any time. My boys heard about Emma's death at about 6.45 a.m. while they were on their way to work at the pipe mill. A friend told them at 9th and Mulberg that they came back home and informed me. I cannot believe it until I saw her. The last time I saw Emma was on Saturday evening. She came home and told me that Charlie had taken her on several long carriage rides through the country, something that he had never done before. He recently secured work in a new store that started on Penn below 4th. He drove the team, and I asked my daughter how he managed to get so much time to himself. She said she didn't know. Last week, one day, he drove over the mountains towards Friedensburg, taking in all the lonely roads. He said he was going for chestnuts but I believe he had murder in his mind that day. But his courage failed him. My daughter hasn't been in the best of hell since the birth of her last child and has been under the doctor's care for some time. Her husband in due time grew tired of her, and I said to him, if he was tired of her, I would take her home with me. When she was here on Saturday evening, she suddenly began to cry, and I asked her what the trouble was. She said, Mother... If you ever hear of my sudden death, don't be surprised and don't let them bury me without holding a post-mortem on my body. Well, I was quite surprised and asked her why she talked that way. She then told me that several days ago she was about to take her medicine when she found it would not mix when shaken up. It always mixed before, but there seemed to be a heavy fluid on top of the liquid. She took some, however, and shortly afterwards was taken with a severe spell of vomiting. She went to her doctor and had him examine the medication. When he told her it contained sulfur and that it was a big wonder, it did not kill her. When she got home, she found out that the contents of the bottle of Rough on Rats, which contained some sulfur and which was left standing on the cellar steps, was empty, at once decided that the stuff was put in the bottle by her husband. He had murder in his heart for some time. In fact, he expressed himself so to his wife. Mrs. Fredericks bears up well under the heavy burden of trouble. She stated that she always brought her children up right and did all that a mother could do for them. She added that for two winters when Keffer was out of employment, she took the family in and clothed and fed them. Mrs. Fredericks is a hard-working woman and has the sympathy of the entire neighborhood. The dead woman was the daughter of Wilson H. and Sarah Fredericks and remains will be removed to their home for burial. She was born at Lyons and resided in Reading 14 years. She was employed as a trimmer at the John R. Miller's Hat Factory for some years. A daughter, Carrie, aged four, her parents and three brothers, William, George, and Harry, remain. Deceased was 24 years of age and was a member of St. Paul's Catholic Church. Mr. and Mrs. Keffer were married February 4, 1896 by Father Cleary. At that time, he was 22 and she 19. His residence was 127 North 9th Street, and the bride was at 102 Neversink. Their marriage license is issued on January 18th. About half past six o'clock this morning, the police station 
was notified of finding a body of a man shot to death at the PNR shoots at Neversink Street between Bingaman and H Street Bridge. Sergeant Hendricks proceeded to the scene and instantly recognized the body as that of Charles A. Keffer. It was still warm and it was evidence that he had lived some time after firing the fatal shot or else the deed had only been committed a short time before. The revolver which he shot himself lay between his legs. Only one chamber was empty, he evidently having reloaded the weapon after killing his wife with the same pistol. His left hand clutched in the pocket on the left side of his coat. In his pocket, Sergeant Hendricks found a copy of a theater program of Peck Bay's Boy and a letter addressed to his mother. It was not dated and was written in lead pencil in a plain hand on a sheet of white paper. It is supposed that this was written during the night and the left hand at the pocket looked as if Keffer was trying to reach for the letter or probably had tried to touch it when dying. The letter read as follows. Dear Mother, forgive me for what I have done. I was out of my mind when I'd done this dirty deed. I loved Emma with all the love I had, but you know she did not treat me half right. I left the mill for another job and was disappointed. She again, she said that she was going to leave me again, and if she did not succeed, she would kill me. She would not come back like the other time. My intention was to shoot her and then myself, but I was so terribly frightened that I ran off. I am very sorry that I've done it, but it is too late. Mama, forgive me, I wasn't all together. You might think that Emma was the cause of it. She drove me crazy. No man with good common sense would do such a thing. If you can, try and bury us together. That is my wish. I love Emma yet, and if I could get her back, I would never attempt to do it again. Forgive me. For doing as I did, I was crazy. That is all. Tell Emma's mother, forgive me, because I was crazy. If I only had another chance, this would never have happened. I would have let her kill me. That would have been better. I say goodbye to everyone. Forgive me. With many kisses for my little child, I hope that I can die as Emma did. Forgive me. I did not know what I was doing. Your wayward son, Charles. P.S. Do not think hard of me. I did not know what I was doing. Emma had me crazy. I was to die on the same spot, but I got scared and, like a cowardly dog, I ran off. The body of Keffer was removed to the undertaking establishment of Francis F. Seidel shortly before 8 o'clock. The face of the deceased showed that it had been freshly shaven and is probable that this was done Monday evening. Near the right ear, there was a bullet hole, and the flesh looked as though the muzzle had been very close to the head, there being evidences of skin having been scorched by the powder. The remains of his wife had been transferred to a coffin standing nearby. Keffer was clad in a dark suit. The identification of Mrs. Keffer was ascertained through the finding of a tax receipt in her pocketbook. It was in the name of her husband, with this clue, which was obtained by Detective Martz and the Eagle, Shortly after 9 o'clock, they visited the neighborhood, and by 9.30, the remains were possibly identified by several persons who knew the woman. It was, however, late in the night before the news of the terrible tragedy was generally known. The police station did not hear of it until informed by the Eagle shortly after 8 p.m. The Eagle called at home of Mr. Keffer later and found the fathers of the couple trying to console each other. This is certainly one of the greatest sorrows that could have come into our lives, said the young man's father, to which Mr. Fredericks gave assent. Mr. Keffer has been an invalid for almost two years, and the shock has affected him greatly. He frequently brushed away tears as he told of what he knew of the occurrence. Charles and Emma lived as happily as I am sure, said the average married couple. There were no disagreements that I knew of, and they were always good to each other. My wife went to New York to visit our other children, and the other day wrote that she was having such a nice time. Emma, upon reading this, said, Yes, but so are we. Charles took her out carriage riding on Sunday, as he had done often before. On Monday afternoon at about four o'clock, Charles came home looking natural and not at all excited. He came home to me and asked, Isn't Emma home? I said, no, I thought she was with you. He turned to leave the house, and at this moment, his little girl, Carrie, came downstairs and lispily asked, 
Where's you going, Papa? To look for Mama, dearie, he replied, and then hurried away. It is not known why he returned to his home after the murder. His father states that the son never kept firearms in the house and that his son had frequently read accounts of murders and remarked, people must be crazy to do something like that. Young Keffer was well educated, having been given a good schooling by his father, who was a member of the legislature for several terms and as a prominent citizen. His age was 26 years. Mr. Frederick's father of the murdered woman said to the Eagle that he wondered why everyone looked at him so pityingly as he was on his way to his employment. When he reached the works, the men said to him, Why, we didn't expect to see you come out to work. He asked why and was told of the killing of his daughter. He could scarcely realize the disaster, and several moments after the men came running to him and said that his son-in-law was found along the railroad dead from a bullet wound self-inflicted. He ran to the scene and identified the remains. Keffer could not have selected a more secluded spot for the preparation of his deed. The road is a narrow, winding one, very stony, and not the ideal route for a carriage ride. It cuts through a dense woods. Mr. and Mrs. Keffer were seen in the vicinity early Monday afternoon. They had passed over the road frequently before. It is said that they were in the vicinity last Saturday about supper time. Then Keffer stopped at a farmhouse and asked that his wife be allowed to pick chestnuts there while he drove to a place further on to attend some business. Permission was granted and he returned in a short time and took her with him over the hill. On Monday afternoon, they put in their appearance about three o'clock. They disappeared in the hills shortly after they were seen seated on the log where the body was found, and it was supposed that they were picking chestnuts. In a short time, Keffer drove to the edge of the woods alone. He turned around and went back, and it is supposed that he came out to see that no one was coming along the road before he committed the deed. Charles Gector was working in a field about half a mile away. He heard two shots fired in quick succession, but this being a favorite place for rabbit hunters, he supposed that some more game had been shot. In a little while, a man was seen driving towards Frydensburg Road, which would lead to Reading at a rapid rate. At times, his horse went at a gallop. About this time, the children from the Oriental School were being dismissed. They encountered Keffer taking his wild drive along the road. They proceeded about a quarter of a mile when they happened upon the murdered woman. She was lying near the log, which she had been seen seated with her husband less than half an hour before. There were about a dozen children in the group, and they ranged in age from 5 to 14 years old. William Wegman, the 12-year-old son of Levi Wegman, living nearby, was the first to make the discovery. With him were William Pott, age 14, son of Samuel Pott, and Lizzie Moyer, the 10-year-old daughter of Abner Moyer. When the children ventured close enough to ascertain what had happened, they called their companions, who included Henry Wegman, Eddie, and Robert Moyer, Henry, Sally, and Ella Wegman, and Hattie and Mabel Loeb. Most of these were mere tots. Speaking of his discovery, Willie Wegman said, I was a little in the lead and I first saw the woman. I thought she was asleep. But then when I saw blood, I got awfully scared and so did all the rest. We got as far away as we could to get past and then ran home and told our parents. We took them to the spot where the woman lay and after that we were not a bit afraid. Samuel Pott, Isaac Moyer, Charles Pott, were working in the fields nearby when they heard the shots fired. Let's suppose that someone was gunning for rabbits. Mrs. Keffer's body was found under a tall cherry tree. It is at the edge of the road of a 23-acre tract of William K. Cleaver in Exeter. Chestnuts are found in the woods here in great abundance, and a number were found around Mrs. Keffer's body when it was discovered. The ground is covered with autumn leaves, and these were bespattered with blood in two places. The fact that the carriage was covered with so much blood and the presence on the ground of it so little gives credence to the theory that Keffer shot his wife in the carriage and drove a short distance before he hurled her body by the roadside. In the opinion of Sergeant Hendricks, Keffer shot himself only a short time before the lifeless body was found. The body was still warm, he said, and everything pointed to the fact that he was not dead very long. There was only one spot of blood. It was a very clean job. Mrs. Frank Reifsnyder, 324 Spring Garden, 
is the mother-in-law of the officer, Harry Harrison. After learning of the find, she remembered that she heard a revolver shot around 6.30 a.m. when she was in the rear yard. Others in the neighborhood also heard a shot fired. As such, noises were not uncommon in that vicinity, they did not pay any particular attention to the circumstance. Many believe from the warmth of the body that the noise of the shot that Keffer was dead only a short time before his remains were discovered. Coroner Rothermerl stated to the Eagle that he did not think he would be able to hold inquest of the cases Mr. and Mrs. Charles A. Keffer before Thursday. He viewed the bodies of both at Seidel's morgue. Hey, it's Bond again real quick. I just want to check in. Thank you guys for sticking with us in this longer past periodical. We did find one more article from the next day, which would have been October 31st, Halloween, uh, 1900, from the Reading Eagle, same paper. We thought this was a important little follow-up. We also would like to apologize for any mispronunciations of any names of people, places, or towns in this article. We tried. Separate funerals. Keffer and his wife will not be buried together. The bodies of Mr. and Mrs. Charles A. Keffer are still at the morgue of the funeral director, Francis F. Seidel, but will be removed to their respective homes late in the afternoon. Keffer, before shooting himself, wrote a letter asking that he and his wife be buried together, but this will not be done and the funerals will be separate. Between 5 and 6 p.m. Monday, Keffer revisited the Rainbow Engine House and remained a short time. Nothing unusual was noticed in his conduct. He was always quiet and did not have more to say than usual. Nothing in his conduct showed that a few hours before he had taken his wife's life. Later in the evening, he visited a clubhouse and tried to get in but could not because he did not have a key. He made several trips to the house before 10 p.m., and some of the members think that if he had suicide in view at that time, it was his intention to take his life there. Coroner Rothermel will hold an inquest in the cases this evening. It will be held in the offices of the Undertaker Seidel.